All right. Do we have anybody that would be uh, brave enough to share their definition of what is worship? Yes, sir. Praise. Say it again. Praise. Praise. Love that. Who else? Yes, Emma. Oh. Celebrating God and what he has done for us. Emma Kennedy, well, close your books, guys. We're done. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do one more just to hear from somebody else. Anybody on this side of the room? Yeah. Say it again. Spreading the word of God. I love it. I love it. So uh, in the next few moments, we're going to talk about worship and all of the many things that worship can be. So good news, if you wrote something down, that is correct. Great job. So, but let's move on to help more, or help better identify what is worship. So in the blanks right there, worship is dot, 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 the ability to connect. Worship is the ability to connect. Now, look, these are not just my words or opinions. These are a collection of answers of conversations that I've had with our pastors, with our worship leaders. You're going to talk to a few of them here in a few moments. Uh, And just articles I've read. Uh, This is just a collection of things, and this seems to be a good consensus. So worship is giving attention, praise, and thanks to God. That's your second fill in the blank there. Worship is giving attention, praise, and thanks to God. To God. The third one there, worship is to enjoy God forever. To enjoy God forever. And I don't know if he actually said that, but I like to attribute that quote to Charles Maynard because it is just so beautiful. And that sounds exactly like something Charles Maynard would say. And finally, worship is connection and expression. Connection and expression. Did I go too fast? Sorry. They're on the screen. They're on the screen. They're on the screen. This is not schoolwork. This is better than schoolwork. Well, hopefully this is an educational experience. Yeah. So this is just a little bit of what worship is. And when we begin to know better what worship is, Maybe we can better understand it and jump in and participate and express it and feel it and enjoy it. So that is what worship is. But let's talk a little bit about how we can worship. So there's something else that we learn about worship, not specifically when, where, or who we're with, but the how of it. And I've provided a couple Uh, scripture references there. They're on page 16 of your book. And as we read these together, what I want you to do is to circle, put a box around, underline anything that seems interesting to you, that stands out to you, that speaks to you, that you would like to go back and maybe remember again. So as we read this, just be looking at what stands out to you. We begin in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Don't be afraid Samuel reassured them, you have certainly done wrong, but make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart and don't turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols that cannot help or rescue you. They are totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. For it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. And in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, we can read, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, I'm not trying to do your work for you, but for me, when I think about what stands out to me, and the how we should worship. It's those first three words from Samuel where it says, don't be afraid. Sometimes in my worship experience, I limit it based on how I think it will impact others. And essentially what that becomes is I can't fully express or enjoy or be present in what's happening right now and how I'm experiencing God in that motion for fear of distracting someone else 
or encountering someone else or swaying someone else. But I often wonder, so if I were doing this exercise like you're doing, I would circle those three words to remind myself that, hey, worship is about connecting with God. Worship is about enjoying God, and I need to get rid of fear. And however I receive that or however I respond to God, I need to be comfortable and confident and what God is sending me, and what I am receiving, and what I'm ready to give back to him. So I don't know if any of you are there, but that is just a personal little note of what we should do. Now, for your personal little notes, let's take a time out right here. Let's do group questions one and two. So that's at the bottom half of page 17. Do group discussion one and two, and then we'll bring it right back here with some special guests. All right, so let's bring it back here. So I want to introduce you to a few folks that maybe you have seen before, but you've never had the chance to meet. Uh, but here they are to help us talk about worship What's tonight. What's up? So, hey, Mike is hot. To Hello. my right, your left, uh, worship leader. What is your full job title here? There's a few things. That's the main one. And video stuff. We'll yeah. keep it to that. All right, so worship leader and video stuff guy, Kirk okay. Wynn. Give it up for Kirk. <laughs> On down the line, uh, Miss Anna Lee, who serves Hello. as our executive. Are you still our executive pastor? That's the last I checked. All right. Yeah. <laughs> My boss just left a few minutes ago, so I probably should have asked him. But as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, they were just here. So, uh, and then finally, all the way across is uh, you will find him mainly on the South Campus, but every now and then he makes his way over to our room, Mr. Reverend Charles Maynard. And you serve as a traditional pastor and... Uh, and stuff. And, and finance stuff. And finance stuff, yeah. There you go. It's on your I business mean, card. I know that I just did poor introductions, but I actually do know a lot about my coworkers, just not their job titles. So, hey, uh, but by, through conversations with these three and also the lovely Miss Dina Seals, who's not with us today, but we want to mention her, uh, there are four things I wish I knew about worship that I wanted to share with you. And these are things that I, as a grown man, learned from just conversations with these adults. Number one, if you can get these when you are in middle school, I guarantee you your worship experiences are only going to improve from here on out. Ask yourself this question. Am I looking for a worship experience or a worship response? Am I looking for a worship experience or a worship response? Now, I think to, answer, to get your opinion on these, we need to separate the two. So would anyone like to explain what a worship experience is and how it differs from a response? Because a lot of times I feel like I experience worship, but very few times would I say I respond to worship. So can we help identify what is a worship experience? Are you calling on somebody? How does this work? Oh, yeah, go for it, Anna. Shouldn't have asked. I mean, I, call, I mean, if we're going to do middle school rules, <laughs> then the first person to speak goes. Yeah, I feel like a worship experience is when you are in a setting and someone is leading you in worship, something's happening, and you can feel that. I mean, you can really feel the way it feels, feel great music, like when Kirk is singing or something like that, but a response is when you take the step to actually worship God. Right. You're not just seeing it happen or hearing it happen. You're letting your heart be moved, and then you're responding in worship. That's, that's exactly what I would have done. I mean, yeah. to say it, it's, a, it's something that happens with us, out of us, that, that becomes a part of worship so that it adds to the experience of everybody else if I'm a part of it, if, if I'm in worship. An experience for me is more a passive thing, um, something that I observe, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Kirk, you have a unique uh, perspective, especially up here, because you're usually up here leading us in those songs that we love to sing and, and maybe even the dances that we love to do from our chairs. So what is it like for you uh, as a worship leader to see people respond to worship as it's happening in front of you? 
That is not that it's about what we receive on stage, but that is probably probably the most rewarding part of my job. Um, and that's what's been kind of tough about this past year is we have been leading a lot to an empty room. Yeah. And so unless you're <clears throat> really dialed in um, yourself, it's, it's kind of tough. So when in the past few weeks when we've had folks back in the room and singing along and, and you just feel their um, energy and, and the way they're responding, it's, and I've said this for years, the best worship leaders in the room are in the congregation. You know what I mean? Because once they get going, not that it's about energy necessarily, but once they get going, the whole energy in the whole room takes off, even with us on stage. Um, so for yeah. me, that is, that is the best part. That is the one thing in a worship service that can, even for me or any of the guys on stage, get every single person in the room involved is when you guys let loose a little bit. And I know it's weird, especially, I remember the time in middle school and high school when there, there was nothing you could do to make me sing out loud. You know what I'm saying? So I encourage you guys to get through that barrier. And once you do, it's, it's a different ballgame. It's pretty awesome. So let's stay kind of uh, in how things have been different this year. So obviously 2020 has brought on a lot of challenges, specifically a lot of new different challenges for the church and the way that we worship, but also the way that we participate in it. So what are some ways that you have been able to have a worship experience in 2020? because it's been a lot different. I know we went, my family went from being in the building, you know, for like two to three hours every Sunday morning to turning on YouTube to watching a live stream for, you know, 50 minutes on a Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I mean, breakfast in, on the couch and in your PJs, and it was cool in that respect, but also it's really tough. So like, what are some ways that you guys have been able to, to connect and have a worship experience in, in, a, in a different era, so to speak? You always speak first, so I thought I'd... Oh, yeah, the one we'll, time. Defer, we'll defer to you. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's been, it's been a struggle. I think that, I mean, that's a great way. I mean, you all know I, I tell stories to groups, and, and it's, there's a, an enormous difference in telling a story to a group, like right here to you, and doing it on the radio. Because even though the story itself... Is the same story either way. It's a very different experience, not just for the teller, but for the, the listener. There's, there's, like what Kirk was saying, there's that energy that, that goes between people. And so that's something that we've been struggling with mm. uh, this year because it is tough. I mean, whether you're preaching a sermon or leading a song or whatever, it's tough to just be standing in a room by yourself um, doing that. And so part of what you have to think of um, Kent Stevens, who usually worships on the south side, is a, is a, a DJ on WIVK. And he said, you know, on the radio, you have, to, you have to remember, you're only ever talking to one person. And, and that was very helpful to me. Is, <laughs> and see, his point is, the listener is in their car, sitting by themselves, listening to the radio. And so when the person that's talking on the radio, they're only talking to that person. And, and for some reason, that helped me try to connect better with you as an individual rather than y'all as a group. Mm. Um, so that helped me on this end. Yeah. But I think you're asking the other question of how are we worshiping, which I think is a great question even without COVID. Yeah. Because there's a difference in leading worship mm -hmm. and in ex experiencing responding to worship. Um, and some of that comes more with friends being in, in a situation where you're in a worshipful setting, not necessarily music or that kind of thing, but having that exchange, praising God, whether it, with my friends, it's with, on a hike, but it's those kind of experiences, but it's together, not me going on a hike by myself and somehow connecting with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think all the stuff that you guys are saying has been true of our family, too. Like, it's weird to not be in here with you guys all the time, and finally now we're starting to have some of that. But um, for us, like, those first few weeks that Josh was talking about when we were worshiping at home, for our family, it was really kind of a novel thing. Like, I never get to really worship much with my true. family. My husband's a worship leader. I work here. My kids are, you know, in the nursery or whatever. 
So as a family, we were worshiping together really for the first time ever. So that was actually kind of awesome and like we were really getting a lot out of that. But I think the newness of that wore off, you know, after a month or so and it wasn't as novel anymore. Um, So then we found ourselves just kind of taking our lead from our kids. They're both really into music and so Chris would pick up his guitar and they would pick a song that they knew from church and we would all just kind of sing it together um, I love to get the hymnal and just pick random hymns and teach those to my kids, and so we've been doing that a lot. Um, so just trying to have those moments of worship, even when it's not like on a Sunday morning time, you know, just learning that yeah. that can be spontaneous, just whenever the Spirit's moving in our household, like we can do that anytime, so that's been a big part of it for us. Yeah, I, uh, and, and I hope you guys find some encouragement in that I asked a question that even the professionals didn't immediately have a response to. (laughs) So just so you know, if for whatever reason you feel like maybe this has been a dry season in 2020 because of the circumstances, yeah, it's been that way for everyone. And this has been a, every week you have to try to be creative or learn something new. And at times it is exhausting because you just wanna, I just wanna go back to the way that things were because we knew that and we connected with that and that meant something to us, and we we're having to work a lot harder for a longer period of time than we all thought. But we're all in this together in our confusion and not having the right answers at the same and time. And I think it was just like, I don't know about you guys, but like I took it for granted that we live in a country where you can just gather for worship anytime and worship God. And when that wasn't a choice for a while, and even now it's not the same, like I realized that that's a, a freedom and a right that I've taken for granted in my life for sure. I won't do it again. I will not take it for granted ever again when we're out of this season. Absolutely. Okay, uh, point number two. Uh, Anna, I credit you for giving me, for giving me this one. So uh, if we are listening to God, he will speak to us any way he chooses. If, we, if we're listening to God, he will speak to us in any way he chooses. And Anna, I checked my notes and I got that from you, and you were actually referring to a Harry Potter book. You said that God spoke to Absolutely. you through a Harry Potter book, and I thought, <laughs> that is magic and of the devil, and how can the Lord? No, sir. Okay, please explain. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I love to read, and so I could not count all the times that I feel like God has used a story or fiction to speak to me about something I'm dealing with or something I'm going through. I have screenshots on my phone, tons of them, of paragraphs out of books that I don't want to forget. Um, So I do that all the time, really. But um, I was telling Josh before we started, like, Disney is one of my things, and I love that game y'all played. But, like, Frozen 2, I would say God used Frozen 2 in my life. Like, God can use anything um, to speak to you. So I think just have your ears open. Be paying attention. Mm -hmm. Charles, I know you're a big hiker. You experience, you experience God out on the trail, I would imagine. Well, I think so, there's that, just seeing the wonder of creation and, and whether that's a minute thing where you're looking at some tiny flower or bug or something or whether it's some magnificent scene. Um, but also, it, I mean, like Anna, uh, reading is very, very important to me. And so I tend to... You get that are, from me. Yeah, I get that from you. I, uh <laughs> My books are all marked up and, and notes and that type of thing. Um, but I think that's, I think part of it is we don't hear God sometimes because we're not listening. And, and so that you, if you're listening, then you do hear something in a Harry Potter book or in a song mm-hmm. or, because I mean, songs, they don't have to be church songs. They don't have to be significantly religious songs. I mean, there's some great music out there on the radio, you know, that you think, oh, wow, you know, and, and sometimes it's only a line or, yeah. or, or a piece of a song, yeah. um, but I find myself thinking, oh, wow, that's a really good, and then I'll end up, you know, Googling the lyrics to see what the whole song says. Yeah, uh, so this is going to be a perfect segue into something that Kirk had told me, which is point number three, but before we get to point three, you had once said something to the effect of why can't church music sound like music we listen to on the radio? And I think what you were trying to say was why can't church, why can't contemporary Christian music be something that we purposefully, intentionally tune into? Like why can't it be good? And I just love that idea. And I think it's, 
I think it's there almost. Or maybe it is. Maybe uh-huh. it's there. I think in the past five years, it's gotten to that point. There for a while, it was kind of Christian rock or pop, and regular rock and pop was completely different. But now it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, it goes hand in hand, I think. So they've done a good job. Yeah. Good job. Because for a while, there was like a cheesy factor. Pretty, you know, pretty yeah. heavy cheese factor for a while. Oh, for it's sure. getting better. Yeah, but, but I mean, Kirk said that the last time we did this mm-hmm. is when, because I remember that. And, and I love the analogy because I think the idea that there are lots of stations with lots of different expressions is a great way to see worship. That, that um, if you're really into country and Western, you're not really going to find that in this congregation. That's not the style that mm-hmm. we worship in. But there are other people that do. Yeah. And I just, I, th- I love that analogy of just, you know, you can tune to different ways and, and it, each one speaks differently to different people. Yeah. So just a quick story on that. The church I worked at previously to Cokesbury, my very first Sunday as a full-time employee, my wife and I went to the contemporary service and unbeknownst to us, it was Bluegrass Sunday. Ah. And they had a full bluegrass band in the contemporary service. And I looked at her and I you said, I think we've made a mistake. (laughs) Uh, Turns out they never did that again in the three years that I worked there, but it was great. So point three, uh, the third thing uh, that I, uh, I wish I knew about worship was anything can be worship if it connects your heart to God's heart. Anything can be worship if it connects your heart to God's heart, and we talked about that a little bit uh, with our books and our songs and, uh, and listening to the radio. Uh, so I want to talk about one more thing before we go to uh, some group questions, uh, but just this idea of uh, worship rituals and worship patterns. We are in a season of being way out of pattern, way out of rhythm. Uh, so if we talk pre-COVID, what were some worship rituals or patterns that you felt like you got yourself into or had to get into or made the worship experience feel familiar to you? Was there a particular prayer that maybe you would read every time? A per, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a, a shirt that you would wear under, you know, that made you play the guitar a little bit better. I don't know. I'm, I'm, Do you I, have that? I, you I should. Think it exists. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, no. We'll look on Amazon. I'm sure it's out there. But let's just talk about rituals or patterns uh, just real quick just to kind of give them some idea of Hey, maybe worship can have this rhythmic feel to it. So you said pre-COVID? Like yeah, not pre-COVID. Okay. Yeah. One for me was um, because I work at a church, and like Kirk was saying, like once we're in here, our brains are like trying to make sure we don't forget anything, and we're you know leading you guys and all of that. So um, regardless of the campus that I was on, I would try to get there as early as I could and catch rehearsal because during their rehearsal, I had no role in that. So. I would sit in the front pew or right here, you know, one of the front seats and just really have some of my own time of worship. So that became like a ritual for me of like getting focused up um, before the day. And that was the time that like I really looked forward to and I miss that a lot Yeah, for sure. I need to come find out when you rehearse and just show up here and just sit in the back. Like Tuesdays? Six o'clock on Tuesday. Okay, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. For me, um, I have, I live about 25 to 30 minutes away. So every time I come here, I have a long car ride, which is good on Sunday mornings or any time we're getting ready for worship, because I can go ahead and listen. By that point, I should have already learned all the music and lyrics. Um, But even, so most of the time, yes, I have. But on the way there, on the way here, I guess, um, is a perfect time for me to just go through the worship set and not really really learn anything, you know what I'm saying? Not, Not really try to not listen to memorize the music because by that point I should have already done that, but more so to just get myself familiar with um, what is about to take place in this room um, so that I can be a little more free and not be thinking about lyrics, not be thinking about chords and all that good stuff and just just literally 25-minute car ride here that I can worship with my eyes open mm-hmm. um, so that hopefully maybe I can be a little bit more available to worship um, while I'm here, not yeah. to uh, like memorize and remember so much. I can't believe you worship with your eyes open. Unbelievable. Well, he was driving, man. He's going to be safe. He was. All right. So let's do uh, in your booklet, uh, let's do questions three. You know what? Do three, four, five, and six. So finish them out, and then we're going to come back 
We're going to wrap up with point four of the four things I wish I knew about worship because it is the perfect benediction for this session. So go ahead and finish your group discussion questions. All right, so we're going to wrap things up. We're going to go back, uh, if, and I'm sorry if you're not done with your questions. I should have managed our time together better tonight. My bad. But so the, to wrap things up tonight, uh, part four, number four of the four things I wish I knew about worship. When you leave the building, you do not leave the church because wherever you are, there the church is because you are the church. And Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you here because this is the benediction that the South Campus does every, every week. Every week. Yeah, yeah. I, I repeat this every week just to remind people. Part of it is I, I think it's important. Some people say, oh, I'm going to church today. Well, that's not really the, the church that you're going to worship today. That's different than going to church to me, the church is who we are, and so I want to remind people, yeah, yeah, you've been to worship today, but let's, let's not forget that you're still at church wherever you go. Um, and I think that's the thing about worship is it's not so much, worship's not so much, some people say, oh, well, you know, I go to worship to refuel, and that's not really what it's about. It's more to express gratitude, to express um, the wonder that you've experienced all week, it's really more of a response to God being in your life rather than, okay, I gotta get filled back up in order to go. And you hear people say like, I didn't get anything out of church today. Yeah, yeah. And it's that idea that we're not coming in here to, worship is about responding to who God is in our life. And, and yes, a lot of times we do get stuff out of that. We leave pumped up or energized, but the point of it is yeah. to give something to God. But I think that benediction, that's the number one positive thing I think about the COVID year, is like really starting to understand that in a real way, that our church never stopped church, even for the months that we weren't here. I mean, we were still the church. We're still sharing the message of Jesus and serving each other and praising God and giving all the things, even when we didn't have a building. That's why people in you know countries where you get persecuted if you go to church, yeah. They're still Christians. They're still church, even when you don't have a building. So I think that's a, that's a really positive thing from this year. But, the, but that thought of, you know, I didn't get anything out of it, the analogy I would use is that would be like saying, yeah, I went to a six-year-old's birthday party, and I just didn't get anything out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't really about you. It was about the six-year-old. You know, you went to give something to this six-year-old, but uh, you might have gotten some joy out of the fact that the six-year-old got excited about the, the gifts and, and to me, that's a great analogy of worship is that you're not, you're not going to get something out of it. You're going to give something, and, and that's what worship is. Yeah, and I included that because, you know, we needed, pre-COVID, we needed that reminder that the church is more than a building. Right. And maybe post-COVID, we need that even, even more. more. <laughs> and maybe even so with worship, that worship is not limited to a building. It's not limited to a time. Yeah. But it comes in w with your eyes open, you know, driving uh, a half hour to work or to church. And, uh, and it comes in many ways. And actually, there are a few ways, few popular ways at the bottom of page 16. There's a few emojis right there. Uh, and then the four emojis represent the four of us standing in front of you, uh, where Charles tends to stand and worship with Janice. I've never seen Janice not at one of your worship services, so that's the two of you. Uh, Anna, you are a hands-high type of praiser. <laughs> Kirk is true. a clapper, Guilty. and I am absolutely the dancer. Yeah. So uh, whatever <laughs> posture of praise that you identify with is correct. That's right. Because this worship is an expression of, uh, of just being with God and being in the presence of God, and I want to thank the three of you for being in our presence today. Thanks for having us. For thank lending you. your worship expertise. Give thank them a you. hand. So thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us today, and let's close uh, with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you uh, for being here, for being present, for being known to us and knowing us. And God, we just say thank you. We are 
uh, a people grateful to worship you. And God, just continue to remind us that because of your spirit and you go wherever we are and you lead wherever we may follow, that we can worship you in that place, in that moment. And it is good and it is right. And God, may our worship bring you joy because our worship to you brings us joy as well. God, we thank you. We praise you. And amen.